Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Shaman, for kind introduction. Uh, so it's indeed a real pleasure to be here uh, speaking in front of all, all of you. And thanks to uh, Swanjo and MPA in particular for inviting Drury to uh, address all of you. So I'm going to speak uh, on the overview of sanctions landscape and its impact on shipping. Uh, what I'm not going to speak about is the law, because I don't understand it. Uh, insurance, I don't understand it, and therefore I'm not going to touch upon any of those aspects. Uh, so my focus is exclusively going to be on the commercial side and the financial aspects of shipping. Okay, uh, very quickly, for those of you who may not be familiar with who we are, uh, so Drury is an independent research and a consulting organization uh, headquartered in London with offices in Singapore, India, and Shanghai, and we have also colleagues in other parts of the world. So in terms of our uh, work scope, we publish scores of research reports in maritime sector, some of whom uh, you may have seen it in the past. We also track about 40 different listed equities uh, listed under uh, different uh, stock exchanges in the world. And uh, we also have point-to-point uh, -point logistics uh, advisory services as well as a bespoke advisory on almost all the shipping sectors. So that's just quickly about Drury. Uh, just moving on to uh, the aspect of sanctions and, and the scope of the sanctions. So if you look at the scope of the sanctions, it's really, really very, very wide ranging. It, it straddles trade, shipping, economic, all, all the aspects actually. Now, uh, while the US imposed a sanction on uh, sort of complete ban on any new investment uh, in most of the sectors, whereas Europe's uh, focus has been more narrow, uh, in terms of bans on, on shipping, uh, almost all the major uh, bulk shipping commodities uh, have been banned, of course, with a varying degrees of uh, restrictions. Uh, but what has really affected Russia the most probably is the ban on the SWIFT. Uh, top 10 uh, banks of Russia cannot access SWIFT now. Uh, as well as for Russian entities, it's very difficult or rather impossible to access uh, European uh, capital markets in particular. And obviously, uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, we, we also see that uh, the, the Russian central bank has not been able to use its money wherever uh, it may be. So now, uh, in terms of what has been its impact at a very high level, so if you look at Russian uh, contribution to the global GDP, it's very, very minimal. It's just about 1.6% at the moment. So it's not really a very significant economy which controls or which affects uh, the global growth. Uh, however, uh, if you look at the growth uh, in 2022 and 2023, uh, it's mainly because of a shock of the war that the growth reduced to about 3.1% in 2020, uh, 2022 and about 2% 2 in 2023, which is expected at the moment. Uh, now, in terms of the export and import, in terms of value, uh, the Russian import uh, value has really fallen by about 25%. Whereas, if you look at the exports, it has really gone up by 15%. Despite that, there has been sanctions as we know it, okay? Uh, which, is, which may come as a surprise to many of us, but that's really a hard reality. Now, in terms of, if you look at the volume, which really affects the shipping and its earnings and asset values, etc. So if you really focus on the volumes uh, of the Russian imports, of course, it has come down. Uh, Russia doesn't have a massive role to play, but nevertheless, it is not insignificant in terms of uh, imported volume. It's just about uh, 100 million tons at the moment. Uh, and this fall has largely been from uh, uh, European countries. Now, if you look at the export, even in terms of volume, the export volume has gone down by about 17%. However, uh, majority of the export, which were directed to Asian countries, as well as, uh, say, China and India in particular, that have really continued unabated, uh, largely. Now, as a consequence of the sanctions, what has happened is uh, 
what uh, all of us, I'm sure, have heard of the term, uh, the French shoring. So there has been really increasing trend in the French shoring. That is the strengthening of relationship between Europe and the US, largely, and, and some other countries as well. But uh, And in terms of uh, trade, it has really become very concentrated uh, between Europe and the US. So as a consequence of sanction, what happened was there was a dramatic increase in the prices. And some of us, uh, or most of us are probably suffering today in terms of rising uh, inflation. And one of the contributory factor was the increase in the uh, food prices, which went up at about by about 14%. However, uh, thanks to the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, there was a shipment of about uh, 32 million tons in last about, say, about 11 months and which really helped stem uh, the price increase of uh, the grains. However, after uh, the attack during the weekend uh, uh, on the Novorossiysk, uh, we've seen again the prices rise, uh, particularly for the wheat, uh, barley, uh, and even some other grains as well. And one uh, phenomenon which has been there for uh, quite some time actually, what is termed as de-dollarization, that is uh, reduction in the role of US dollars. Uh, that has really got accentuated uh, post-sanction. So as you can see in the chart uh, to your left, uh, the share of uh, US dollar in the foreign reserves used to be about 65% in 2016, which has now come down to about 59%. And, uh, yeah, but if you look at the second chart uh, next to it, and the role of US dollar is very, very prominent. For example, forex transaction volume is about 88%. So it's undefeatable. Uh, forex reserves, it's about 59%, as I said, trade invoicing is about 47%. So US dollar plays a very, very dominant role in international transactions. However, when you look at what has happened in the past one year, almost all the transaction between China and uh, Russia is taking place now in RMB, the yuan. And that's a massive development. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the SIPs, which is the counterpart of SWIFT, uh, or this is Chinese uh, SWIFT, you, could, you can call it, uh, it has had a transaction to the tune of $14 trillion last year, which was an increase of about 21%. So, so definitely there is a dent uh, in the US dollar's dominance, but it is still, I would say, a long, long way to go before you see that some other currencies can take its place. Okay, uh, now moving on to the shipping market in particular. So uh, one of the markets which got massively affected was crude tanker market. Uh, though uh, there has been ban in place uh, since December last year uh, in terms of uh, import of crude. Uh, there has, the, all the crude uh, from Europe has got redirected now to largely India, China, and to an extent uh, some other countries as well but it has largely gone to India and China. And in fact, uh, 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 India continues to even push for its own currency, the Indian rupee, uh, in the trade, but of course it hasn't really succeeded in a great way. Uh, and, and the robustness or the uh, or resilience of the Russian crude, you can see in terms of either Russian production, Russian refineries throughput, or uh, even the exports on all the parameters. So overall, it, uh, the trade remains, or export remains at around, say about five million barrels per day. Now, uh, as I said, there has been a complete sort of realignment uh, in terms of the crude uh, uh, trade. Now, for Europe, of course, the, the US, Middle East, and Africa has become really an important partner. Uh, and there has been a massive increase in imports from the US. As a result of this, what has happened is uh, there has been an increase in the ton mile, means the distance multiplied by commodity, uh, by about 15% last year. And this year we are expecting an increase in the ton mile to the tune of about 56%. Similarly, for the European crude imports, again, there has been an increase uh, in the distances, that is about uh, 22%, and we are expecting incremental 9% increase this year in 2023. So there is uh, so essentially what it means in very simple terms that it is coming from a longer distance or it's going to longer distances. Now in terms of clean petroleum products, uh, again, sort of a similar story, but interesting thing here is that uh, Europe has started procuring uh, CPP or the clean petroleum products from uh, US, Middle East and Indian subcontinent. An interesting thing to note is 
the Russian crude comes to Indian subcontinent and refined products go to Europe. So uh, I, I'll, I'll leave you to think about it uh, yourself. Uh, but overall, what we see is that there has been an increase uh, in the uh, CPP import from uh, North America, South Asia, and Middle East to the tune of about 1.7% annually. Now, uh, you can see uh, there is an arrow at the bottom of, of the screen. That is when the war was going on. There was a massive increase in import from Russia into Europe. Massive increase, actually. And, and that is when the war was raising. Of course, after the ban was put in place by EU, then it, it started coming down, and now virtually nothing. Now, in terms of the chemical trade, uh, it hasn't had really a massive impact, uh, but Europe has been importing methanol from Russia, which is now being redirected from uh, the US. So that has been uh, a key in, in terms of the chemical market. Of course, in terms of soybean oil, uh, sorry, uh, sunflower oil, which was being exported from Ukraine, which has suffered. But uh, thanks to, again, the Black Sea Green Initiative, uh, as part of which about 1.52 million tons of uh, so, uh, sunflower oil was uh, exported from Ukraine <clears throat> uninterrupted. Now, as a result of all of these developments, what we saw, there was a massive increase in the earnings of the, in the tanker sector, be it crude tanker, be it product tanker, be it chemical tanker. And you can see uh, the arrows I have pointed out. And after that, you see that the market has been absolutely berserk, which, of course, means it's a good time for all these tanker owners. Uh, now, moving to the gas segment, uh, Russia has been about 40% uh, uh, exporting to the team of about 40% of gas to Europe, uh, which now, after the ban has come into place, it has come down. It hasn't become zero, just to let you know. It, it has come down to about 15% as of last month, in July 2023. So uh, the US, uh, sorry, the Europe still continues to import uh, a big volume of uh, gas. Uh, now, if you look at the first half uh, of 2023, about 17 million tons approximately of gas was imported from Russia into Europe. Um, and <clears throat> as a result of this ban uh, or sanction, what happened was there was a massive uh, uh, initiative to increase the regasification capacity in Europe. And right now, as we speak, there is a plan or under construction of about 90 million tons of regasification capacity, which is massive growth. And if you really go back a little bit a couple of years ago, in the European ta uh, EU taxonomy, LNG was not supposed to be there. So there was, uh, in fact, uh, I remember we were having conversation with one of the sovereign wealth fund. Uh, I wouldn't go into names, etc., but they said clearly they will not invest in LNG. That's pre-war. But for now, you have 90 million tons, so I'm sure everybody will be investing uh, in that. So there's a complete turnaround, of course, uh, unfortunately, because of war. Uh, and of course, uh, just to say that Germany, of course, has been the probably uh, reliant most uh, in terms of European countries. And therefore, you see the massive expansion taking place in Germany to the tune of about 36, 37 million tons of uh, LNG capacity. <coughs> Uh, again, in terms of uh, trade realignment, it has happened in LNG as well. Uh, the U.S. exports uh, to uh, Asia has come down by about 40%. You can see in the chart, the left chart. Whereas that of Europe, it has gone up by 121% uh, in uh, just one year. Uh, China's uh, share uh, in, of course, uh, Russian uh, LNG has gone up, but that's not very significant, sort of very minuscule. And as a result of this realignment and the sanctions, there was again LNG market was another market which went berserk, uh, with the earnings going up to about five hundred thousand dollars a day, never seen before uh, that kind of rate. Uh, the LPG market was less uh, affected mainly because there was a, a, a demand was subdued uh, from the industries and the pet chem sectors. Nevertheless, there was an, uh, a slight increase in, in the LPG import from the US into Europe. So as you can see, largely the entire story is essentially everything being redirected from the US to Europe, most of the, of the commodities that I have spoken so far. Now in terms of grain, because grain has been, of course, a big uh, issue uh, in, the, in the global shipping market. So the grain prices, as I had mentioned, uh, went up dramatically to the tune of about 14% uh, in the aftermath of uh, the war. Uh, 
and uh, so which uh, despite that you had a black uh, black sea green initiative there was a fall in exports uh, from uh, Russia and Ukraine, of course, because the, this BSGI or Black Sea Green Initiative came into being only in August. So between uh, February and August or February and July, you didn't really have any trade flow uh, or much of the trade flow happening. Uh, the coal has been another commodity as you know, the, uh, we have been talking about dirty coal. Again, nobody was investing in, dirt, in coal but we saw the coal again being revived. And the European coal import went up from 53 million tons to 84 million tons. That's hopping 58%. And many of the coal uh, firepower plant in Germany and other countries were revitalized, essentially to cater to the requirements of, of the deficit. So the, the, uh, one of the questions which uh, I, I think uh, we need to also ask probably is, uh, the, the energy transition is, is really not so straightforward. It is really buffeted by all kinds of issues and geopolitics being one of them. That's a very critical element in, in, in the energy transition. Uh, of course, again, coal has come from the US uh, into uh, Europe. So that's why if you remember I said, uh, there has a lot of, been a lot of friend showing in a sense in the, in the international trade. Of course, uh, and that has been true for actually majority of uh, the European countries. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm heading towards the end because I have been sh told to stop now uh, very soon. Okay, so just on container shipping, which of course is very important for us here. So we saw there was a 50% reduction in container services in Russia. As you can see, there's a dramatic, uh, uh, so steep decline at the end. Uh, and most of the mainline services which were being uh, uh, catered to by uh, Maersk Line and MSC uh, into Russian ports, uh, those were completely stopped. As a result of which, what we saw was that there is an emergence of many shipping lines uh, uh, from China, and in fact, some from even uh, Dubai, uh, which has started catering to the Russian ports. So as a result of fall in services, what you saw is the container port throughput of the Baltic ports or Scandinavian and the Baltic ports really came down, I think about by about 15% or so uh, last year. Uh, and overall, obviously because of that container throughput of Russian ports came down by about 23%. Uh, so of course, Russian, uh, the Scandinavian ports and the Baltic state ports have also been a victim of uh, this uh, trade war, or not trade war, but the war. Uh, there has been some other, other impacts which are not so significant. Uh, Japan uh, has recently banned uh, the export of car. Uh, Europe also banned the export of car, and therefore you will see when the PCC, PCTC market probably getting affected. Uh, though I mentioned uh, earlier about uh, the, uh, the energy transition issues, or what I would like to reemphasize is that despite that, there was a setback in terms of increasing uh, import of coal and increasing import of LNG. Uh, EU has actually set a stronger uh, target now. Uh, current target is about 32% of share of renewable energy in the energy mix. It has been increased to 42.5%, and EU is sort of persuading uh, the countries to go into 45%. So on the face of it, it does look that energy transition has got a, uh, got a setback, but nevertheless, EU seems to be uh, really right on the track of moving towards energy transition. Thank you very much.